All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Today's June 28th, and it's time for our worship service. I've chosen Psalm 101 for our call to worship. If you want to rise and stand with me as we sing Psalm 101, or as I read Psalm 101, and then we'll sing our opening song. And Psalm 101 is one of those psalms that you, you wondered if you could be David's friend, because he has a high standard here. Psalm 101. I will sing of the steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. I will ponder the way that is blameless. Oh, when, you, when will you come to me? I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. I will sing of steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. Oh, wait, I went the wrong way. <laughs> A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. Verse five, whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has haught, a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. I will look with favor on the faithful and the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Morning by morning, I will destroy all the wicked in the land, cutting off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. Amen, the word of the Lord. Psalm 101. Let's sing How Great Thou Art.
please be seated. Morning, everyone. Do we have any updates or additions to our prayer request list? Any other updates, additions? We don't have any activities yet, so. No activity. It is 4th of July this weekend coming up. Yes. So this is the last Sunday before then. Yes. Anybody got any 4th of July plans? Yes. Uh, by the way, the police are So, be very careful. <laughs> yeah. And stay back. And, uh, if you have three staffers, stay in the cabin. Any other updates, additions? Birthdays, anniversaries. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> Birthdays, anniversaries. Yeah. Let's have our birthday sang for Nancy. Many happy, happy returns on the day of thy birth. May sunshine and gladness be given. And may the dear Father prepare the honor for a beautiful birthday. Don't feel bad. I had to think about it there for a minute, too. We said that in all like. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. All right. All right. Let's close with prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we just ask that you be with those that were mentioned um, that are and those that weren't, that are on our hearts and on our minds, Lord. We do just ask that you be with all of us, Lord. Be with this country. Just shield us with your protection, Lord. And uh, just lead us to where we need to be and, and help those that need to be helped. And Lord, we do ask this just be a day for you. And we just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have to remute our participants out there. So there we go. Better. Everybody okay? Yes. So we're going to continue on with our next uh, praise song, which is Jesus Loves Me. Please join us as we sing Jesus Loves Me. Jesus does love us. Our next song will be Whiter Than Snow. 
He loved us so much. He went to the cross, and he, his death cleanses us and makes us whiter than snow. communion hymn now and hopefully we're still recording and and we'll just continue on just as i am let's let's sing just as i am as we prepare for communion as we sing the last verse linda will come up and give us our communion meditation and and then we'll partake of our communion Yeah. 
As I stopped my car at a red light, I saw the same man standing beside the road again. He held a cardboard sign saying, need money for food, anything helps. I looked away inside. I was a kind of person who ignored the needy. Some people pretend to have needs, but actually are con artists. Others have legislate, legislated needs that face different, face difficulties um, overcoming destructive habits. Social workers tell us it's better to give money to the, to the aid ministries in our city. I swallowed hard and drove past. I felt bad, but I may have acted wisely. God commands us to warn those who are idle and destructive, encourage the disheartened, and help the weak. To do this well, we must know who belongs in which category. If we warn a weak or disheartened person, we may break their spirit. If we help an idle person, we may encourage laziness. Consequently, we help best from up close when we know the person well enough to know what their needs really are. As God burdened our hearts to help others, then that's great. Now the work begins. Don't assume you know the person's needs. Ask her or him to share their story and listen. Perfectly give its its wise senses it seems wise and not merely to feel better. When we truly aim to do the good for each other, we will be more readily be patient with everyone, even when they stumble. Amen. Please join me for prayer. Lord, as we come before your table this morning, as we bow in our spirits together and prepare to partake of this communion, we recognize the sacrifice that you've made and recognize that you did for us what we could not do for ourselves. In, in our own spirit, we rebelled against you willfully. We sinned against you. You create us, created us in your image, and yet we went astray. But your great love, your mercy, wouldn't let us be there. And so you came into your creation. You freely laid down your life so that we could have eternity with you. And so, Lord, this morning, as we partake of this bread and this it's juice that represents your sacrifice on the cross, may you be glorified, Lord, and may we once again just acknowledge your great sacrifice and humbly before you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Please partake of communion. Amen. Please join me as we say the, the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Wonderful to see everybody out this morning, and, and especially I, I read a couple of news articles yesterday to see how so, some states like Florida and Texas are battling COVID-19 anew and are having record number of cases uh, being discovered, I guess. Um, so like their, their outbreaks are ticking up. In fact, I think Florida is even closing the beaches over at least Miami over Memorial or over Fourth of July weekend. So, you know, it's, it's just more of the same. Kurt, I hope you're right with the election, it'll all end. So it will be nice to get to that point. And as we said earlier, we have just so much that, that we got the Sierra sandstorm flying overhead right now from the Sierra desert. And, and that's just one of the many things that has happened this year. I love that meme that Allison shared with us that, you know, they always wanted to go back in history and, and see what, what, what it was like, like to live during the Civil War, or maybe the Spanish flu, or maybe the Great Depression, or maybe the Dust Bowl of, of the 30s, or, or um, whatever else. There's a couple other things, huh? Civil oh, Civil Rights March of the 60s, you know, to, to actually live through and experience those things, and yet, the year 2020, we've experienced them all. Watergate, all of them at once. Killer hornets, murder hornets. And so, and what do you say, frogs now? Poisonous frogs. Poisonous frogs. <clears throat> 2020, they, I guess, it's, which one? Right. <laughs> not yet. No, not yet, so. <laughs> but we do have the burning of our cities. And so, last week, Today we're going to talk about integrity a little bit, but last week we talked about Father's Day and how to be a good father and also how to be a good child. And on the left-hand side of the screen there we have how to be a good father, some of the things we saw, um, that a good father was righteous. Um, a good father loved God and family more than the praises of men. Um, that a good father had great faith in God. Right? We saw that through the different Bible characters we looked at. We saw that they trusted God above their, their own self. You know, that's, that's kind of difficult. We saw that they loved their family, that they had a multi-generational faithfulness, and that they, most importantly, never gave up. Never gave up. Or never give up. We never give up, right? As dads, we never give up. You know, that's failure, is giving up but continue to try. But we also looked at what was a good child, and we used the John 14, 15. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Remember in Deuteronomy, we have that the, the Israel saying, the saying of Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. These commandments are to be upon your heart. Impress them upon your children's heart. And it goes on to tell you to talk about them when you rise up, when you lay down, when you're at home, when you walk along the way, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your front gates, bind them as symbols on your forehead and around your wrist. That's how important it is to love God by obeying his commandments. When they asked Jesus, when they asked Jesus then, what was the greatest commandment? That's what he said. The first and greatest is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Or mind, mind and strength. Strength and soul and mind, whatever. Three of those. Mind, heart, and strength. It's important. That's the most important thing. God is our life. To love God. But he, and then he said the second is like it. To love your neighbor as yourself. Right? And we said that was the golden rule. On the screen, you can see the golden rule. Remember, boys, we talked about the golden rule. And we I've talked about the golden rule with the family this week, trying to, to make sure that we kind of learn the golden rule. Luke, Jesus says, records Jesus as saying, do unto others as you would have them do to you. There was a couple opportunities this week where we've seen some of the children, I won't name names, but 
practice the golden rule in, in a unique format. Some of them would be, you know, if someone did bad to them, they would do bad back because obviously that's, they did unto me this way, that's how they want me to do unto them. That's the golden rule in action, right? Or I remember one of my coworkers once said that my kids would probably quote King James and said, I did unto them before they did unto me. So those are not the golden rule, right? The golden rule is to treat others the way you want to be treated. Better than you want to be treated is to put them first, right? But today I want to talk about kind of how some of the ways we can put the golden rule into practice. And what we see in the world today is, is just incredible. We see people out there that, are, that have passion over integrity, over principle. And we see that acted out over and over again. We see lies being replaced for the truth. We see people declaring racism as they're saying racist things. And I was just sharing with the family the other day that the, the, the phrase Black Lives Matters is a very racist phrase. Anytime you take one group of people with a group of nationality or <laughs> cultural principles and rise that up above others, either positive or negative, or separate that out, it is racism. What we need to do in this country is have integrity and principle. We don't need to get passion, passionate about everything because those things, everybody can be passionate. Everybody has an opinion that leads to following our own will. What we need is in order to have the golden rule acted out, we need integrity. So integrity, I'm gonna start the integrity day with a couple questions and then a few stories. I found these stories on the internet. They were just some stories that kind of highlight integrity because integrity is something that is really easy to grasp in story form, you know, to see it in action, especially when you see it in action in extremes. And that's really important. So I guess the, the, the question is, let's say you started a new business. You start a new business and you have just a few clients and it's a repetitive business. So a few clients is barely keeping you afloat. Month to month, these same clients, they pay you their money and you're bar barely making ends meet. If one of those clients should no longer be a client of yours, would you tell that client? If you said nothing, they would continue to be your client, but you know, that they're not getting what they should be getting from it. Would you tell them? You, you're barely making it now. You won't be making it if you tell them, but you know that they're not getting what they're paying for. It's not worth it. Is that something you would deal with? I was thinking the other day, you go to a garage sale. Someone has a box there. It's locked. Can't, can't open it, they don't have a key, but they have a box. As you're playing, you ask them how much it is, they say, ah, give me, give me a quarter for it. As you're playing around with it, you open it up and you find three $100 bills inside. Do you buy it for a quarter? <laughs> or do you realize that maybe something is going on there that this person did, didn't realize that those three $100 bills were in there and that you, you should say something. Let me read a couple stories here about integrity. They're on the screen. I got five stories and they won't take a real long time, but you can follow along on the screen if you want. Monty Roberts, again, I found these five on somebody's site and they have, they've cited some, they've cited sources and I've included those sources. Monty Roberts grew up around horses in California. His father was a horse trainer and Monty was riding before he learned to walk. This was during the heyday of Western movies, and as a child, Monty rode horses in movies, often as a stunt double for child actors. He later got into the rodeos and horse show, shows and earned a reputation as a great horseman. Roberts always dreamed of being a horse trainer himself, and with a wife and a couple of kids to support, he figured it was time to get serious, and so he went off 
into business, and in spite of his reputation as a great Robert, r- writer, Roberts was an inexperienced trainer and had trouble getting clients. He had only four horses to train, which wasn't bringing in nearly enough money to support his family. Roberts wasn't sure what he was going to do when an opportunity opportunity was presented to work as an apprentice with Don Dodge, one of the most well-known and well-respected trainers in the area. He was told to bring two of his horses with him. After 10 weeks of the apprenticeship ended, ended and Roberts met with Dodge. One of the horses he had brought with him was named Panama Buck. Dodge told Roberts that when he got home, he should call up the horse's owner, Lawson Williams, and tell him tell him that he was wasting his money having Roberts train the horse because the horse was never going to amount to anything. So here you got it. Started this new business, has four horses, barely making ends meet, and now this great horse trainer is telling you to go home and tell one of the clients, take him back, he's never gonna work. Thereby cutting your salary by 25%. How many of you can survive on that? Just chop off 25%. Get ready, because Illinois is getting ready to raise 10. No, wait, I'm sorry. All right. So, Roberts was understandably reluctant to do this, as that would eliminate a quarter of his already meager income. When he asked Dodge why he should do this, Dodge responded that the most important thing that he could do was always tell the owners the truth about their horses, and that if he did this, he would soon get more than enough business to replace the loss. Well, Roberts went home and did as instructed, but Williams didn't take the news well. He responded by berating Roberts, screaming, you useless son of a gun, you wouldn't know a good horse if it leapt up between your legs. That's the best, that's the last horse you ever get from me. Several days later, Roberts phone rang. A voice on the other end said, hello, Mr. Gray here, Joe Gray. He went on saying, I was having lunch with Mr. Williams yesterday, and he was complaining about you. But from what I have heard, he must be about the only honest trainer I've ever heard of. Well, I know that Panama Buck horse of his wasn't any good, and I just want to take a flyer on you. I have this horse I want you to want to send to you. It's called My Blue Heaven. From that point on, things started to turn around for Roberts. He gained a reputation as not only a great trainer, but as an honest one, and soon he had more than enough horses to train. Eventually, he would have, even have the opportunity to train horses for the Queen of England. And it, and it all started with following some wise advice from a mentor to always be honest, even when the price is high. That's integrity being honest, even when the price is high. It's easy to be honest when it doesn't cost you anything, right? It's easy to give when it doesn't cost you anything. We see that all over. But when it counts, when it matters, is when it costs. Integrity is doing the right thing always, even when when there's a cost. Here, he did the right things. Second one, Andy Andy Roderick. In May of 2005, an American professional tennis player, Andy Roderick, was playing for Nando Verdasco of Spain in round of 16 of the Italia Masters Tennis Tournament in Rome, Italy. Roderick was the number one seed in the tournament and a heavy favorite to win the match in advance. Roderick was one of the top players in the world. He was at the top of his game. Indeed, just one month later, he would make it to the finals at Wimbledon before losing to Roger Roger Federa. So he was an amazing tennis player. But this match in Spain, he dominated as expected and had triple had triple match point when something extremely unusual happened. Roderick couldn't return Verdasco's hard second serve, but the linesman called the serve out and awarded Roderick the point, which gave him game and match. Okay, so he's playing this thing, and all of a sudden, the ball hits out because he couldn't return it, but the ball didn't hit out, it hit in. But the linesman caught it out, the judge said it's out, and he won the game. What would you do? You won the game. You're you're a professional tennis player. The umpire made a mistake, but you are the winner now. What would you do? 
Well, with the crowd cheering, Verdesco ran up to the net to shake Roderick's hand and congratulate him on his victory. However, Roderick knew something that the linesmen in the Empire and cheering crowd didn't know, even Verdesco didn't know. The serve had not been out, but had hit the line, marking it in. Roderick could have kept this information to himself and accepted the victory. Indeed, honor calls are not expected in tennis. They have lines when they have judges, right? Instead, he informed the umpire that the ball had been in. He offered to show the umpire the mark on the clay where the ball had hit to prove his point. The umpire reversed the call and awarded the point to uh, Verdesco. Okay. Having been given a second chance, Verdesco made the most of it. He came back to win the game, the set, and the match, giving him the highly improbable victory, especially considering that not long before he had been standing at the net ready to concede. Some sports writer here said that that act of honesty cost him at least tens of thousands of dollars, perhaps much more, if he had gone on to win the tournament. Integrity was clearly more important to Roderick than either winning or the money. And Roderick lost the tennis match that day, but won something more important. And it was in the process that set a great example of sportsmanship for competitors everywhere. Three more. Okay, you see this one. He could have been silent. He ended up losing the game because he what had integrity because what was right mattered more than winning. Have you ever been in a, have you ever been in a game where you do things like I've done it many times. If back when I was younger, Kathy and I would go play volleyball and I, I was very competitive and I would, I would hit the ball. I would jump up and I would spike the ball and it was all to win the game. And it didn't matter who was on the other side. It was often we were playing against other church folk in, in these games. But I would just, I would play hard because I wanted to win. You know, I was competitive. But that was, that was an ugly behavior. I mean, when you spike a ball into one of your daughter's faces, or <laughs> that is just ugly, right? So competition is competition, but... Let's go on. Ian Rosenberg. It was early December 2005 when the 23-year-old Ian, Rosen Ian Rosenberg um, hung desperately to an ocean buoy off the coast of Palu in the Western Pacific Ocean. I know I murdered that. He had been there for over 12 hours, hanging on to a buoy. What in the world's going on? To someone unfamiliar with the situation, Ian's condition might appear bleak, but Ian, Ian, whatever, was not a castaway from a shipwreck. Instead, he was a contestant on the popular TV show Survivor, where contestants compete for a grand prize of a million dollars. Ian was one of three contestants left out of the original 20, and this was the last immunity challenge. If he won this challenge, he would be one of the final two contestants for the million dollar prize hanging on a buoy, 12 hours he's out there in the middle of an ocean, hanging on a buoy, crazy stuff to win money, right? Having been given a second chance, oh wait, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way again. The challenge was a simple but brutal test of endurance and per perseverance. Each contestant would cling to the ocean buoy as it swayed sometimes violently in the waves and the one that could hang on the longest would get a free pass to the final round. The other two contestants hanging on to the buoy were Katie Gallagher and Ian's best friend on the show, Tom Westman. Katie dropped out after five hours, leaving just Ian and Tom. As the hours marched slowly on, the challenge became increasingly difficult physically, but for Ian, the bigger challenge was psychological. Alone with his thoughts, he considered, began to consider how he had played the game and how much the million dollars meant to him. Ian could see the clear path to victory in his mind. If he won the challenge, he would get to choose which of the two contestants to eliminate. He saw his friend Tom as a bigger threat. Ian felt that if he won the challenge and eliminated Tom, he would have a clear path to victory. So what's the problem here? He's, he's playing this game. They're both playing this game. Hang on, win, and win the money, right? Is there any problem so far? I don't see a problem. Let's go on. I've included it for a reason. Anyway, 
Ian, or I, Ian, was an Eagle Scout, and as he clung to the buoy, he began to repeat the words of the Scout Law, a scout is trustworthy, loyal. Ian stopped. He knew he had been neither, he had been neither while playing the game. He later said, I'd been backstabbing people, and I was planning on doing that to my best friend in the game, and I realized I would lose that friend if I continued playing the game in the same way. Every time I pulled money out of the ATM account with a million dollars, it would bother me. Ian thought of an example he would be setting, especially to his younger sister. I thought about scouting, and I thought about the people who would watch me win. They wouldn't have been proud, so Ian quit. Not just the challenge, but the game. He gave up and asked his friend Tom to eliminate him. Tom reluctantly agreed, and the chance to become an instant millionaire was over for Ian. As Ian predicted, Tom went on to become the sole survivor and win the million dollars. Thinking back, Ian stated, I realize it's not just winning the million, it's how you win it. That is what I learned in Scouts. It's not just accomplishing something, it's how you accomplish it becomes important. He added, I decided to bow out, and that was because of the Scout's law and because of my sister. For Ian Rosenberg, living according to the values he learned in scouting was worth more than a million dollars. Does he have any regrets? I can't say that the cash wouldn't come in handy right now, but I'm completely happy with the decision I made. I don't regret it at all. It's only a million bucks. If I left with pride and a story I could be proud of. Although if I stayed, I wouldn't be eating Raymond noodles every day as I am now. So, I'm so. Not all right. Well, there you go. <laughs> Amen. All right. So you guys get the point here. So here's another one. Let's say how many of you own houses, or a truck, or a car. Let's say you agreed with a local neighbor to buy your. They were going to going to buy your house. They gave you made a price and said, I'll buy your house through this, and you guys shake on the deal, or your vehicle, okay? As the lawyers are drawing up the paperwork, the housing market falls out, and the bottom of the market falls, and prices crash, and now your house is worth a fraction of it was what it, what it, what it was worth before. Wait, let's switch that. You were gonna buy a neighbor's house, okay? You're gonna buy a neighbor's house. Now it's worth a fraction of what you agreed to pay for it. Would you follow through with the deal? Probably not because, because if you had to get a loan, the bank wouldn't loan you the money, so whatever. But would you follow through with the deal? Here's an interesting case. James Dotty was a man of, in, of many talents, among them neurosurgeon, entrepreneur, and university professor. Oh, this is different one, but early in his career, he was heavily involved in developing a technology to bring to market the cyber knife. In the process, he became wealthy beyond his wildest dreams. Dottie is also very generous. With a net worth of $75 million, he pledged stock worth $30 million to charity. Not long after the pledge, his investments were hit hard by the dot-com crash of 20, or 2000, 2001. Dottie lost almost everything. The only thing that was left was his pledged stock. The lawyers advised Dottie that he could get out of the pledge. They told him people would understand that his circumstances had changed and that they wouldn't expect him to follow through. Dottie considered his options. He later said, one of the persistent myths of, in our society is that money will make you happy. Growing up poor, I thought that money would give me everything I did not have, control, power, love. When, it fin when I finally had all the money I had ever dreamed of, I discovered that it didn't make me happy. Dottie decided to follow through with his pledge and give away the last of his fortunes. How and how did he feel after the gift was given? Dottie stated, at that moment, I realized that the only way that money can bring happiness is to give it away. You can add one more item to Dottie's list of talents, integrity. With the price much higher than he initially thought it would be, Dottie followed through on his commitment of giving. And the irony is that only after the gift was given did James Dottie find happiness, the happiness he had been searching for. So he followed through the pledge even after he was personally devastated. And the last one here, I just want to read through this quickly. 
and this goes back to the question I just asked. Um, John M. Huntsman Sr., after lengthy negotiations, John M. Huntsman Sr., founder and CEO of Huntsman Chemical Corporation, had come to an agreement with Emerson Campin, chairman and CEO of Great Lakes Chemical Company. Great Lakes would buy 40% of Huntsman for $54 million. As Huntsman liked to do, the agreement was sealed with a handshake, $54 million. Although it was a fairly simple transaction, by the time the corporate attorney finalized the paperwork, seven months late had passed um, between the hand, since the handshake between the CEOs. During this time, the price of raw materials had plummeted and Huntsman's profits had soared. So they were going to sell it for $54 million. One day, Huntsman received a phone call from Emerson Campin. Campin informed Huntsman that according to his bankers, 40% of Huntsman's company was now worth $250 million. Campin felt, given the circumstances, that the $40, $54 million price tag they agreed to seven months prior was no longer fair. Campin said, I can't commit Great Lakes to making up the full estimated value, but how about splitting the difference? Campin was offered to pay Huntsman almost $100 million more than they had agreed to. Huntsman replied, we agreed to a price of $54 million, and that is the price I expect you to pay. Camp encountered, but that's not fair to you. And Huntsman in the conversation stating, you negotiate for your company, Emerson, and I'll negotiate for mine. The sale went through at $54 million. <coughs> Huntsman operated on the principle that his word and his handshake were a bond. He was not willing to compromise that principle, even for $100 million. Huntsman's integrity was worth more to him than any amount of money. Okay. I hope you get the theme here, integrity. Integrity costs, it often costs. And when it's not a hard decision, there's not integrity involved. Integrity is living up to principles when there's pressures against those principles. And we see those pressures all around us today. And we see people operating with passion and not principles. Integrity is falling by the wayside. Integrity. A noun in the dictionary says, the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness, as in he is known as a man of integrity, the state of being whole and undivided. Similar, you got some synonyms over here, honesty, upright, um, you can, rectitude, honor, honorable, good character, ethics, moral, high-mindedness, decent, fairness, okay? The opposite, is dishonesty, integrity and dishonesty, kind of opposites there according to the dictionary. This is all good and great, but there is no scriptures there, right? Let's go to the scripture. You go to the Bible and you will find pictures of integrity. You will also find pictures of people operating without, without integrity. But there are pictures of integrity, and one of the best pictures I see out there is in the book of Daniel. If you go to the book of Daniel, you have um, the book of Daniel is writing after the Lord has turned over Judah to the Babylonians for exile. And the Babylonians come in and capture Jerusalem, Judah, and they exile the, the people that live there. They take all the nobles, they take a lot of the people, and they bring them back to Babylon as captives. Only as captives, they're not going to live as captives. They're going to live as in the integrated society of Babylon. And so what King Nebuchadnezzar does is grabs a bunch of noble youths, youths that are, belong to the nobility, to people with money that have been taught, educated and he puts them into his boot camp so they can serve the king so they can become part of his uh, advisors and you remember the names and it's kind of funny because they have Hebrew names and they have Babylonian names and we all remember Daniel's Hebrew name but we remember his friends Babylonian names so we always say Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is, are, are uh, Babylonian names. Daniel is a Hebrew name. Belshazzar was, was 
Daniel's Babylonian name. Anyway, if you recall, as they go into this training program, they had integrity. No one was watching them. The law of the Lord that they had grown up learning and living by, that this is how they glorified God, was they were being asked to violate that. Not purposefully to violate it. It's just this new regiment, this new training program, becoming part of the king's servant meant drinking wine, eating all the meats they had there, among other things. They could have easily went along with the crowd. But they had integrity. And they said no. And what they did was actually more risky. It was going against the captors that had just captured them and saying no to them. Now, Daniel did it diplomatically, but the Lord glorified and, and blessed Daniel and his friend's decision to remain true to the word of God. And they grew strong and wise. And later on, we see that same type of integrity being displayed with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when King Nebuchadnezzar built a huge statue of gold, right? And what did he want everybody in the kingdom to do when they blew the trumpet? What? Bow down, Bow down and worship the statue of gold, which again was a violation to God. God tells us that we are to, to have no idols, right? We're not to do, we're not to bow before graven images. And so when they blew the trumpet, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what did they do? They didn't bow down, did they? And King Nebuchadnezzar calls them forward. And he's sitting there, and they tell him that they are not going to bow down before the statue. That, that you know, he, had, he had this blazing furnace, and he says, he says, I'm going to throw you in the furnace unless you bow down and worship me. So now they have the choice of either being having integrity and obeying God's word and being thrown into the fiery furnace or to go along with the king. It'd be so much easier for them to go along with the king, at least, at least in, their, in their minds, right? But they obeyed God rather than man. And what happened? The king throws them in as people throw them into the fire furnace. The furnace was seven times hotter. The men that threw them in, what happened to those men? They died. It was so hot. And yet what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They lived. The king, the king saw them walking around in there, right? He saw, how many people did he see inside the fiery furnace? Four, not, not, not three, but four. And he said, one of them looked like the son of God, right? And so he calls them out and they come out and not any of their clothing was burnt. Not any of their hair on their head was burnt. More importantly, how many of you have ever been by a bonfire or cooked out over a fire? What happens like afterwards when you get in the shower the next day? What do you smell like? smoke you can't get around those things without smelling like smoke and yet they didn't even smell like smoke they had integrity they had integrity throughout scriptures i got a number of them coming up on screen first peter three sixteen, paul or peter is talking about how important it is to have integrity keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak malicious against maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander, okay? Proverbs has a whole lot to say on integrity. Integrity is probably the most important thing we can have before mankind because how can we share his love with the world, share his truth if we do not have integrity? Proverbs 4, 25 and 27, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths of your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Proverbs 11, the integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. Proverbs 12, the Lord detests lying lips but he delights in the people who are trustworthy, integrity. Proverbs 21, 3, to do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. To be a man without integrity 
and acting pious is not acceptable to the Lord. Proverbs 28, better the poor whose walk is blameless than the rich whose ways are perverse. Second Corinthians, Paul is talking about a collection that he's taking up with, and, and Titus is going to go and pick up this collection for the needy churches in Jerusalem. And integrity is very important in this whole process. In, in Second Corinthians chapter eight, the whole process is about Paul telling them how much accountability and integrity is in this process and how much they can trust Titus who's coming to them. And he says, for we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of man. Integrity was important to Paul and his message. Hebrews 13, 8, he said, pray for us that we, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. Psalm 41 says, I know that you are pleased with me, for my enemy does not triumph over me. Because of my integrity, you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. Amen. Isn't that great? And then lastly, in Philippians, he says, finally, my brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Integrity is what we need to show and have. Integrity is difficult. It's difficult. It's easy to give in to the pressures. Jesus would have been the perfect example when we had Jesus going into the wilderness. He could have easily turned the stones to bread. He could have easily fall into temptation at any point in time and given them, but he resisted and resisted and resisted even at the, at the, before the cross in the garden. He could have given in and called for angels to save him, and, and so he wouldn't have to go through that, but he chose to be upright before God and accept what God had for him. Integrity in Matthew chapter Five. Remember when we were reading that? It says, you are the light of the hill. A town built on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand that gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. If we have no integrity, we our light will not shine. People will not have a reason to even look at it. We have to be people of integrity. We have to have conviction. We have to be, passion is, is fleeting. We have to be purposefully convicted of who God is in our life. Amen? Our closing hymn is Have Thine Own Way, Lord. And, and we're going to stand and sing that now. Nice gentle rain. Have thine own way.
Lord, more than blessing. Lord, again, we just thank you so much for this day and this opportunity we have to come into your presence, to come as your people, your church, into this building. And Lord, we can hear your words. We can sing songs of praises to you, but Lord, that we can be your spirit renewed in us so that we can go back into the world as your light, as your hands and feet, to show your love and mercy, to show compassion on those who need compassion, to, to mourn with those who mourn. Lord, to, to help those that are struggling, to feed and clothe the hungry. Help us, Lord, and get, give us those opportunities this week. Um, help protect us from, from, the, from the fear of the evils in the world so that we can be your hands and feet. And for everyone here, Lord, I just ask that your hand a blessing be upon them, that strength and courage will come, that as they see the world around us, around them, with your eyes that and, and the opportunities to serve that that you will strengthen them to and do those opportunities and that you will be glorified as it's done in all things lord i thank you and it's in your name we pray amen thank you very much and then